What's up? I'm live. I've got sleepy eyes for sure, so bear with me. I'm like feeling the allergies. I don't know what's going on with the allergies these days, but my eyes are a little puffy, so just gotta keep my eyes wide open. I don't know if I'm like getting sick or what. I mean, it would make sense because I'm like staying up really late, but allergies are on point. I live like backed up to a nature reserve that has oak trees everywhere and the oak trees are ridiculous. Like sometimes they let off just all this pollen. So I'm struggling. Okay, you guys can throw them at me. Hi everybody. And if you guys are a client or you're waiting on an email from me, I apologize. It's just been kind of one of those weeks. Today is kind of like I have to carve out some chunks of time to answer emails or I get really distracted and it's like a time warp. You you then you're like, "Oh my gosh, it's 5 hours later and I've like just spent 5 hours answering emails." So, um I will be answering all my emails today though. What are the treatment for varicose veins in pregnant women? Um the tr that's a, like that's kind of the wrong question you always want to ask like what's going on why do you have varicose veins it's usually like a circulation problem a blood pressure problem um it can be an estrogen issue it can be um usually like a circulation issue whether that's rosacea or bursted blood vessels or varicose veins a lot of times has to do with oxygenation and also you know blood flow so that's usually metabolic you have to look at like blood pressure your pulse rate your temperatures you kind of got to figure it out but usually if you have a problem going on that's kind of like not showing up once you get pregnant that usually will show up right away so uh, it's hard to know uh, I don't know what the treatment necessarily would be um, sometimes like magnesium oil or MSM or Arnica can be helpful for reducing the inflammation but um, I don't think there's like really a treatment you kind of have to have the baby see uh if those varicose veins improve over over time after uh, after pregnancy good morning can you please share some phase nutrition tips especially during the menstruation period of the follicular phase yeah so um for people that don't necessarily know their cycle or uh, i'll just review it really quickly so you know you have your period which is the start of your follicular phase a lot of people or apps will call this the menstrual phase it's not technically that we can call it the menstrual phase just to get the point across but it's really your the beginning of your follicular phase and that lasts all the way up until you ovulate so the first half of your follicular phase, you usually do bleed. And then um, the second half, your body's kind of preparing to drop an egg. Once you ovulate, then the corpus luteum becomes a gland that makes you progesterone and that begins the luteal phase. And so it's very important to acknowledge that your body's going through changes throughout throughout these phases all the time and so your your nutrition needs do change however it's important to know that it's foundational to always take care of your body throughout all the phases right but there are a few things that you can do to support each phase so during menstruation you have to understand that this is actually a detoxification they actually believe that this is why women live longer because we actually drop, um, you know, we're, we're detoxifying through the vagina, we're getting rid of old blood, making new, and it can actually be a very detoxifying or rejuvenating time. We do need to understand that our period is a time of depletion and it's not a great idea to go ham at the gym while you're bleeding. Makes common sense, right? But some people... We, we don't necessarily practice common sense when it comes to our bodies all the time. So days one through three should really be no workout. It should be walking, resting, um, napping, making sure you're getting plenty of sleep. And then if you feel like pretty good day four and, and, and beyond, that's when you can maybe work out, but it wouldn't go crazy with cardio and I definitely wouldn't like go really hard. It's always about listening to your, to your body. I usually during menstruation just don't really wanna work out and so I just acknowledge that. I might do a little stretching I might do more sauna sessions than normal, but I'm not gonna push my body to work out Usually it works against you during menstruation. It's not like you're like, oh, I'm not burning calories I'm like you're just creating stress during your period So my biggest thing is be very conscious of when you're working out 
and then also you really want to replenish certain minerals so iron is very important because you're losing blood but iron from food not from supplements from food like grass-fed beef grass-fed liver um, making sure that you're really replenishing the things that are being lost and if you have symptoms during your period I mean a lot of times symptoms actually happen pre-period right during the luteal phase and once menstruation starts a lot of women actually feel better um, but if you do have symptoms you do want to support detoxification a lot of women actually lose their appetites when they're on their period and the worst thing you can do is not eat so your hormones are at their lowest so your blood sugar does tend to be a lot more imbalanced and if you're not eating every like two to four hours even if it's just a tiny little small meal you can really find that you are feeling crappy and you might be like why you know I'm not hungry and it's like you need to keep your blood sugar stable so during menstruation it's about really resting rejuvenating keeping blood sugar stable and really nourishing yourself you do have a little bit of a higher calorie need then and it's okay to eat um, and if you crave something tap into those cravings if you're craving chocolate you need magnesium if you're craving beef you need iron zinc copper if you're craving salt you need salt um, if you're craving fat you need fat you know so really just tap into those cravings it's not like oh I'm craving a Twinkie I need a Twinkie it's more like why would I be craving a Twinkie right now maybe I need some good sugars or some good fat that kind of thing um, and then during the follicular phase, it's really important that last half of the follicular phase is to really make sure that you are limiting stress. No alcohol. Um, keep in mind your body's preparing for the drop of an egg to potentially be fertilized. That is a time where your body is thinking, okay, is it safe to drop this egg? And a lot of women don't understand this, and so they're pounding the alcohol, they're pounding the caffeine, they're not eating regularly, they're over-exercising, and why do you think your body is going to drop an egg if you are in this constant survival mode or your liver is being depleted or you know you're not taking care of yourself you gotta sleep you gotta move get out in the sunshine make sure you're eating regularly and enough make sure you're exercising but not over exercising and having fun right de-stressing um, and then flip over to the luteal phase that's where detoxification really starts to set in so I really like to lay on the castor oil packs and the coffee enemas during that time I I always do my chlorophyll lemonade to make sure my liver is detoxifying and then I try to do a dandy blend um, like latte or some kind of dandelion root um, elixir for bioflow. So those are all things that um, I do during the luteal phase. And sometimes if you have more severe issues, you do need to lay a lot heavier on the detoxification if you want to have a better period the, the following month. But um, good it's really good to focus on detoxification during the luteal phase but this is going to be one of the lessons in fully nourished so one of the lessons is cycle awareness and how to kind of support your body each cycle hello i went to the naturopath and she recommended black cohosh ova blend probiotics and myonositol and advised me to eat animal protein since i've been vegetarian any thoughts insulin resistance yeah animal protein for pcos is so important because all the starches where you're going to get protein from in a vegetarian diet also comes with fermentable starches i mean beans grains nuts all are very inflammatory to a very inflamed gut. They have phytates and all these plant poisons on them that can really inflame you. And so I do not think that women with PCOS should be vegan or vegetarian. It can be very, very stressful on women's hormones in general. Even if you don't have PCOS, I mean, we I see it all the time you guys people come to me like long-term vegans or long-term vegetarians and their health is just in shambles and they didn't even really notice like they thought like oh i'm not sleeping well or like oh i can't lose weight not realizing that there was like a huge issue going on because you're not getting fat soluble vitamins you're not getting enough uh protein that's bioavailable meaning you can absorb it it's one thing to eat enough it's another thing to get what you need and then specific amino acids are very healing and therapeutic like glycine good luck getting enough glycine from from a vegetarian diet it comes from gelatinous um, collagenous foods and things like bone broth and collagen and gelatin and so I, you know, I honestly think like if someone was coming to me on a vegetarian diet, that's what I fix first. And then if their issues don't change, then we might need to add supplements. But I always take a food first approach because no amount of supplements is going to out um, fix a bad diet. Hi, how did you figure out the price for your ebook? Um, it's not an ebook, it's an e course. So there's um, like 
there's a recipe book that comes with it that's over 200 pages there's uh, PDF guides um, about 25 of them in there and then there's lessons and modules and videos tutorials walking you through everything so it's not an ebook guys it's an e-course it's an online course walking you through how to nourish your body both from the nutrition perspective and also from the lifestyle perspective um, and that's why it's so expensive it would literally be the amount of, of information you'd get from working with me one-on-one -on -one, probably four or five sessions worth maybe even more so um, the the reason that you know people are like oh it's so expensive and I'm like well <laughs> one session with me is 225 so if you're looking at it like from that perspective it's quite cheap so um, you know just know that I've spent you know hundreds of thousands of dollars on my education and hundreds of thousands of hours on my education and so I you know I have to charge the value that I offer to you night sweats is my evening snack not making the cut um it could be that it could also be that um you know you're are you sleeping in clothes women do much better sleeping naked if you're if you get cold feet then maybe put some socks on but um it's much better to pile blankets on top to let your body regulate its own temperature than to put clothes on and you're kind of forcing your body's temperature um to to like be either too hot or too cold so it's best to kind of let your body regulate its own surface temperature during the night a lot of women find that just sleeping naked it helps with their night sweats tremendously um, and then some women do need to kind of sip on when they wake up in the middle of the night do like a sip on a little bit of juice or sip on something that's gonna kind of like calm them down like a little coconut water or a little something with a little salt and a little sugar nothing crazy just to kind of like get the stress response down even like half a banana rolled in some salt is a great kind of midnight snack so um that can uh that those are some things to try if if it's still that then if it's still happening it could just be that there's a lot of stress involved or a lot of estrogen involved my hair is thinning she sent me to do more blood test hoping for the best yeah i mean a lot of times on a vegetarian or vegan diet you'll find the hair thinning because remember amino acids are the building blocks of the body we don't want to just make sure we're getting enough we want to make sure we're getting more than enough because we want our body to have all the tools necessary to build what it needs to build um, or it's just going to prioritize repairing things over actually building things how much water should I drink? Coconut water or water or whatever. I think I'm sodium deficient and constantly chugging Gatorade. If I drink coconut water, regular water, I pee too much. Yeah, you need definitely some electrolytes. So I would lay on the OJ, um, the bone broth. Gatorade is definitely not your friend because of the dyes. The dyes are um, gonna be uh, very estrogenic and also the, um, uh, the sugar is usually high fructose corn syrup. They don't use regular sugar. So um, those are kind of like really hard on the liver. Um, so coconut water, that is real. Make sure it's real coconut water and not like coconut concentrate with sugar and water added. Um, and then juices, watermelon juice specifically is wonderful for electrolytes as well as guava juice. So those are really two amazing juices. And then you also wanna add a bunch of trace minerals to those things. So I would like add extra trace mineral drops if it were me, um, but I would never actually drink water. Um, I, if I was like struggling with that, that constant like chugging, constant thirst, um, that just shows that there's a, a severe mineral deficiency. And then you also wanna make sure you're getting lots and lots of uh, of, like high quality salt on your foods so you're liberally salting everything to taste your tongue is a great gauge for how much salt you need if something tastes too salty it your body's saying I don't need salt remember that your tongue has a purpose your taste buds tell you if the body wants something or not that's actually what the tongue's purpose is um, that's why we have different taste buds that taste different flavors there's a purpose to it so um, I would really liberally salt my foods and then I would not do any water um, now that's not me like saying don't drink water like go thirsty no you drink when you're thirsty but I probably wouldn't reach for the water I would reach for more electrolyte mineral rich uh, drinks and kind of stay away from just chugging water remember a lot of people who have severe metabolic issues don't need a lot of hydration at all because their body's retaining a lot of water their body can't usually a normal functioning body will eventually evaporate like sometimes up to a liter of water from the skin and will sometimes um, you know you'll you'll utilize that water when you're not utilizing water and you're just peeing it out constantly 
that shows you probably need less water you know remember most foods are up to 70 percent water and so people act like you can't get enough like hydration from food and i'm like you kind of can especially if you're really metabolically unstable sometimes drinking water can be very stressful on a, on a, a person who has hypothyroidism or pcos if you're not thirsty for it don't drink it so thirst is that biological signal that tells you that you need hydration and if you're not thirsty, don't drink. It's as simple as that. Just like your hunger is a signal if you need fuel, your thirst is a signal you need water, you're tired, that's a signal you need sleep. I mean, we have biological signals to tell us what to do so we don't have to play a guessing game or have, have somebody else make the rules for us. What are your thoughts on a hair mineral test? Um, yeah, I really like HTMA tests. Um, I use them in my practice um, and they can be very helpful. You do know how, have to know how to read them or you can miss a lot of the, uh, I guess they, the, a lot of the minerals and heavy metals interconnect with one another. Um, but yeah, they can be very helpful. They're not, to me, like, it's not the thing that I think is like the thing, but it's part of the tool. For me, if I had like my optimal testing for every person, it would be an HTMA test, a GI map to test what's going on in the gut, and a Dutch test, and to test what's going on with all of the hormones, and then a full thyroid panel. And that's pretty much all the testing that you need unless you have severe health issues and that doesn't get you enough information. Then testing things like neurotransmitters or um, like heavy metals or mycotoxins can be helpful. I get acid reflux when I drink tea, even with herbal teas. Why is that? Oh, I'm not sure, but herbal teas can be high in fluoride. And if you are not, um, like if it's just not uh, digesting well or your body already has too much fluoridation um, from drinking like unfiltered water or, um, you know, bathing in a lot of unfiltered water, then it might just not be um, something that's working for you. Or on the flip side, a lot of herbal teas do have some antibacterial or antifungal type effects. And so if you're like really imbalanced dysbiosis, you have lots of bacteria or fungus or things like that, um, that could be killing that. So there's a few things that it could be and it's hard to know exactly what it is. Where do you recommend using uh, magnesium oil topically? I remember there were two spots and can only think over the liver. Um, I usually say like on your whole body if possible, like the more skin you cover the better, um, but over your liver specifically can be helpful. And then like on any soreness, like muscle soreness, so if you work out at the gym or you have arthritis or something like that, um, putting magnesium oil topically on where, it, where it's painful is a, is a good, a kind of a good thing. If you have to take into antibiotics for a strep infection, anything I could do to help the gut? Yeah, so um, you don't wanna take probiotics while you're on antibiotics. That's actually one of the worst things you can do. Um, and they're all, not all antibiotics are created equal. So some are actually okay and then some are definitely like very harsh on the gut. Um, but understand too that if you have strep, uh, strep is usually, if you are susceptible to stre streptococcus, you probably have a vitamin A deficiency. Um, vitamin A deficiency very often makes women susceptible to the streptococcus virus. And um, you, or I shouldn't say the streptococcus virus, it is a bacteria, but it it kind of it's it's a virus slash bacteria it's it has like a very unique um way it goes about getting into your tissues and coming back and so i would it's kind of one of those things where you kind of have to weigh the infection if the the virus has got or the infection has gotten so bad that it needs antibiotics of course like take them and just let your your body recover afterwards for about eight weeks um you can do like i always say that naturally fermented foods are better so probiotics have a lot of downfalls so many women are taking like wild strains they have no idea if these are even native strains of bacteria to their gut and um the only probiotics that i think are good are spore-based probiotics, so like Thrive or Mega Spore Biotic are both good brands, and then you can always get them from your food. So making kvass, making kombucha, making sauerkraut, making any type of fermented foods is, is really good. And if you need to buy fermented foods, I know everyone was like confused about my post the other day, it's just important to understand that how fermented foods are produced is everything. If these companies are using really cheap strains of bacteria that are shelf stable and they're using them because they're shelf stable, not because they're native to your human digestive tract, that's most likely going to 
mess you up. That's not going to help you in any way. They need to choose strains of bacteria that are good for you and native to the human digestive tract. And a lot of companies don't care. A lot of companies don't care about you and they just kind of care about their bottom line. And so a lot of like kombuchas are made with a lot of lactic acid producing bacteria, which are not great for the human digestive tract um, in high amounts. You know, so they're, they're adding these cheaper strains. And so it's important to make your own fermented foods as much as possible. Um, but there's been a study done that was very interesting and showed that if you take probiotics while you're on antibiotics or six to eight weeks after antibiotics, you, it actually takes longer for your gut to recover and to rebalance itself than if you take probiotics while you're, um, while you're on antibiotics. Any brands of inositol that's not made from corn? Um, I'm not sure, honestly, like most B vitamins, including inositol, which is vitamin B8, is sourced from corn. That's why I always recommend food-based supplements, you guys. A lot of people don't realize that synthetic vitamins are very irritating and can actually be very allergenic. So you could be taking something and it could be providing you lots of benefit, but on the flip side, it's also irritating the hell out of your digestive tract to the point where it's actually causing leaky gut. And so I, like in Fully Nourished, a lot of the supplements are actually food-based. I have you prepare them yourself. Self, um, because of this reason. I don't want you on a huge stack of synthetic supplements that you could be reacting to. And um, B vitamins are one of those things. I recommend using brewer's yeast or nutritional yeast as a B complex. It has all the B vitamins except for biotin, but you can get plenty of biotin if you're eating um, like some good high quality dairy and some good high quality grass fed beef liver. So biotin is not that hard to get if you're eating a nutrient dense diet, but brewer's yeast and nutritional yeast that's unfortified, make sure it doesn't have synthetic vitamins added, is a wonderful thing that you can uh, eat for B vitamins. And you can bake them into cookies. A lot of like lactation cookie recipes um, are made with brewer's yeast and, or you can just use nutritional yeast as kind of like a topping or you could mix it into a sauce. There's lots you can do with those um, yeasts. Is it okay to drink celery juice right after my morning lemon water, pink salt, hot water, or will it dilute electrolytes in my body? Thanks. Um, celery juice can actually call it like in some people cause more harm than good. It's very cooling and um, it can actually be kind of irritating, especially if it has any pulp in it. Like it needs to be very pure, but it's kind of one of those things where it's kind of up to you. Um, Celery juice kind of mimics um, certain things that are healing. So it's kind of a band-aid. Like it's just very rich in potassium and sodium, like a lot of the minerals that I talk about here. And um, the reason why a lot of people feel like it's so beneficial is because it's rich in those things. But um, you can get those things from a lot of other places as well. So it's kind of one of those things where if you struggle with hydration, you definitely don't want to overhydrate yourself. Um, but on, on the flip side, if you really like need the celery juice, it helps with digestion, then yeah, drink it whenever you want. What well, might be causing my night sweats? I also have to pee a lot in the morning. Sorry, TMI. Um, you're probably drinking too much liquid before you go to bed, if that's the case. And then, um, if but a lot of times adrenaline does make you pee a lot. So a lot of people who have like high stress hormones, cortisol or adrenaline, they'll pee more than four to five times a day. That's pretty much the norm. If you're peeing any more than five times a day, you're probably stressed out or you're over drinking water. Um, but uh, if you have night sweats and you're peeing a lot in the morning, could totally be like an adrenaline thing. A lot of times night sweats is actually driven by stress. Unless you're older, which I don't know what your age is, but sometimes as you kind of get near to perimenopause or menopause, you can begin to make less progesterone, which won't balance out estrogen and then will lead to night sweats. And so if I like was approaching menopause, I mean, I take bioidentical progesterone now, but I will probably definitely be taking it when I'm approaching menopause because I know that my production is going to go down as I get older. Hi Jess, it's India. Hey girl. What does it mean that my waking temp pulse is within your normal range and my post breakfast temp is lower, but my pulse is higher? Thank you. 
Okay, so this is a great, a great question. So if you're waking up and your temp and pulse is within the normal range, but your temperature is lower after you eat, then that shows that your temperature was being driven by stress, not by proper thyroid function. Because this is why t just taking your temperature can be deceiving. It could, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm in the normal range, I'm good, but they take their pulse and it's very, very, very low, or on the flip side, very, very, very high. Low is showing you that there's metabolic suppression and high is showing you that there's stress hormones. If your pulse is just raising but still within the lower range, that's showing that your meal is increasing your metabolic rate. However, your temperature is showing you what your true temperature is, where your actual metabolic function is. So stress can drive heat, which is why temps can lie pulses don't lie so pulse if your pulse is raising that shows your meal is increasing your health it's showing it's improving your metabolic rate however it is lowering stress which does improve the metabolic rate but if it's going to lower stress it's going to lower your temp if your temperature was driven by stress i know it's a little confusing but pretty much think of it this way your body can get heat from two places it can get heat from taking your fuel and metabolizing it the stuff that you put in your mouth or it can get fuel for, from breaking down your body for fuel using cortisol. And so a lot of women with metabolic issues are in that second state, that cortisol state. Their body's breaking their tissues down for fuel constantly. And when you are taking your temps, you could see them be artificially high because of cortisol. And so when you take your pulses, you start to see like, oh, metabolic suppression is happening, meaning my pulses are really low or there's lots and lots of stress and my pulses are really, really high, um, but you can kind of use both as information. But pretty much if your temperature is lowering after breakfast, it shows that you're waking up with immediate stress. Your, your adrenaline, cortisol is breaking down your tissues for fuel from the moment you wake up. Probably was already happening while you were sleeping. I have really brittle nails that almost peel off in layers, anything you think might cause that. Yeah, most likely a protein deficiency, whether it's a, a not eating enough or not absorbing enough. Um, usually kind of laying the collagen on heavy can be really helpful or gelatin rich foods. Um, and then bone broth is also wonderful for that. How can I eat more during my periods? I get so nauseated during my periods and then feel so weak after. So if you get nausea during your periods, that's showing you that you have lots of estrogen playing a role during the luteal phase. Remember that nausea always stems from improper bile flow, almost always, and estrogen slows bile flow, which is why women who have PMS their whole life usually get their gallbladder removed when they're 45, because gallbladder issues always stem from estrogen issues. So, you know, nausea during the cycle means that you gotta really support your body just detoxification during the luteal phase leading up to the cycle. If you're having a really symptomatic period, that is a check-in. I always say your period's your monthly report card, right? It's telling you where your health is, how your health is balanced, and if your period's awful or it's symptomatic, or you know, you can't eat like a normal person, or you can't um, sleep like a normal person, there's work that definitely needs to be done. What can I do about low progesterone levels? Watch my story on progesterone. It's labeled progesterone. I talk about how you get your body making more progesterone, the corpus luteum. Um, and then, you know, you can always supplement bioidentical, but it's always good to get to the root cause because um, you want to ask yourself why you're not making enough. Do you think acne has any genetic component or do you think acne can be completely healed through diet and lifestyle? It can be completely healed through diet and lifestyle. It does have a genetic component in the sense that women who can't detoxify estrogen properly usually pass that on to their children. Um, but that's because they probably had that estrogen dominance going on that was imprinted on the fetus or imprinted on you while you were in your mother's womb. So if you have acne that runs in the family, it's most likely a genetic um, component of detoxification of estrogen. A lot of people have acne, their testosterone is turning into estrogen in the liver. Um, or their guts are reactivating estrogen, which really inflames the glands. And actually, remember, estrogen damages the, the oil production, um, the sebum glands or the oil production glands in your skin. It causes them to dysregulate, get, becoming inflamed and irritated. And so, you know, it can completely be healed through diet and lifestyle. It's just you got to dig deep sometimes with acne. You got to look at gut health, gut bacteria. You got to look at hormone detoxification, how that's happening, sometimes mineral imbalance 
imbalances can be a huge one. So there are a lot of components to acne, especially if it's been like a lifelong struggle. There definitely needs to be some digging done. It's not just like, oh, you know, just detox your liver and just change your diet. Like it's so much more than that. What's your view on 85% dark chocolate? Bad? No, I mean, I eat milk chocolate, I eat white chocolate. Dark chocolate's good for you too. Like you guys need to stop giving asking people on instagram for permission for what foods you're allowed to eat if your body tolerates it well and your the ingredients are body honoring mean that they are not made in a factory and um something that your body cannot recognize it's a-okay to eat it's fine to eat as long as it makes you feel good warms you up is delicious to you you attract are attracted to it it's appetizing to you go for it do not look for uh, people to give you permission to eat foods been eating per your rex for a couple months now just in this last week i feel like i've had the most wild sweet cravings i feed them with oj ripe fruit and cocoa but what gives See, this is a problem with our culture is that people see sweet cravings as bad when in reality, if you're craving carbohydrates and sugar, it means your your metabolism is speeding up. You are actually burning things like you're supposed to. Just like children have wild sweet cravings. Let's look at a child, for example. Their metabolism is quick. They're the, usually the healthiest. They heal very quickly. Why do they always crave sugar? It's not because they're bad or naughty. It's because they know innately that their body burns sugar. And now their parents do them a disservice by feeding them candy and junk and this and that. But at the end of the day, their body runs on sugar. <laughs> so it's same with you. You're not any different. And usually when you start to actually give your body what it needs, you begin to see like, okay, I'm ramping it up. You, When you crave something, you feed it with OJ. When you crave sugar, you feed it with fruit. When you crave carbs, you, you feed it with roots. You actually are giving your body what it's asking for for the first time in a long time. And cravings are a compass. Now, if you are... You, those sweet cravings are excessive, meaning it's uh, like becoming obsessive. Check in with how much protein you're eating. Check in with how much fat you're eating. Make sure you're getting enough salt. Those are all very, very, very important. Um, but sometimes it's just a sign that the metabolism is speeding up. Women can, uh, once they start to actually eat frequently and regularly, they realize they can tolerate up to, you know, a ton, a ton more carbs. Because a lot of women are on low carb diets without even re recognizing it. They're eating from like 100 to 150 grams of carbs and, you know, under 90 grams of protein. They're on a diet for a toddler, you know, enough food for maybe a toddler a four-year-old and when they actually start to speed their metabolism up they start eating like a grown-ass adult and they're like whoa I'm like eating a lot like is this bad I'm like no this is actually normal you know you're welcome <laughs> so I wouldn't look at it as bad um, I would look at it as your body kind of starting to get the picture that you're giving it what it needs obviously if it seems like it's wrong or like it, there's something maybe a little bit off it could definitely be like a magnesium deficiency or sodium or potassium you know there can always be like some mineral imbalances involved but craving sugar is not always bad especially if you're satiating it with the right types of sugar slash carbs sugar and carbs can be used interchangeably i use the word sugar because i want to get it through your guys's head that sugar is carbohydrates there's all these people on instagram saying there's good sugar and there's bad sugar and I'm like it all literally breaks down into fructose and glucose and then lactose when it comes to dairy that that's on a molecular level that's what it's breaking down us so yes you want your sugar to come from pl places where it provides you with a lot of nutrients but at the same time like stop acting like there's good sugar and bad sugar um it's always how you combine your sugar what does it combine with if it's with that processed you know, refined flour and that canola oil, that's absolutely going to dampen your ability to burn that sugar. If it's combined with some coconut oil and some bone broth and some, you know, wild cod, that's going to just, your body's going to burn right through it and you're going to feel hungry in two to three hours because that shows that you're revving up that metabolism. You're seeing your body burn fuel efficiently. That's what it's supposed to feel like. A, a, a healthy woman has a voracious appetite. A, a vital person is hungry. They're, they're constant, their body's constantly asking for fuel because their body's using fuel. Does that make sense, you guys? See your appetite as a gift. See your cravings as a gift. Your body tells you when you're hungry and your body tells you what it needs when it's hungry. Isn't that incredible? Acknowledge that that's incredible. 
I bought progesterone cream and I've been taking my temp for about a month now. Should I keep taking my temp for a few months to see what's going on before I start using the progesterone cream? Um, it's kind of up to you. I always think it's good like when you start a hormone or something like that to kind of have something to gauge it against. A lot of people just use their weight as a gauge for progress and that's just a horrible gauge because weight is so relative. So taking temps and pulls can be helpful in kind of helping you figure out if progesterone's lowering your stress or raising your stress. You can really start to track patterns, but uh, as long as you kind of have something to go on, um, I don't think there's a reason to wait unless you feel more comfortable taking more information. Is canned tuna and water an okay option for quick protein? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, just make sure that it's like the sustainable tuna. So um, sustainable tuna just means that they fish them when they're a little bit smaller fish so that they don't have as, t as much time to accumulate as much mercury. So um, the, the sustainable tunas are just a little bit less mercury or heavy metal rich. And it is important to understand that tuna does have a lot of heavy metals, so it wouldn't be something where you want to like pound five times a week or every single day but it's definitely can be a part of the rotation for sure is there a way of getting rid of hay fever yeah I mean there are a lot of things like honestly just a quick antihistamine is not necessarily the worst thing I think that antihistamines can actually be used very um therapeutically um, on yourself you know as if you do enough research obviously they can be a little harsh on the liver so they should be used as necessary but they're helpful for people with like hay fever and histamine because there is like an allergic histamine reaction going on so um, you know nothing more powerful than an over-the-counter antihistamine in my opinion a lot of people will push like quercetin which is antihistamine but it also has some estrogenic qualities so I find that it can maybe do some more harm than good um, so it's kind of one of those things where I just just honestly take a Benadryl or take a um, another over-the-counter there's a few that are that are okay whereas like the newer second generation ones like Zyrtec and Claritin are not as good for you and not as as beneficial as at blocking histamine um, best way to relieve arthritis arthritis is usually driven by estrogen and inflammation so the best way is to actually get your gut healthy and to really work on getting enough progesterone which is anti-inflammatory and anti-estrogenic a lot of women who have arthritis also have very high estrogen or they're not detoxifying it properly and quite low progesterone Are fruits modified? I hear that they're not as healthy because they inject them with growth chemicals. Um, it is important to eat fruit that is organic as possible or even local. Like I always encourage you guys, if you have access to a local farmer's market or something like that, where you can actually shake hands with the farmer, that's a really awesome way to know exactly where your food is coming from. But everything that we eat right now in our society is modified. Actually, cruciferous vegetables and leafy greens were not edible for a very long time and will until we started actually um, hybridizing them until we could consume them. And it's very similar with fruits. However, the fibers in fruits are a lot more easy to digest than the fibers in cruciferous vegetables and like the brassica family and um, leafy greens. They were not always edible. They were actually bitter or poisonous and your body would be like, hell no, I'm not eating that so if we're gonna talk about like modified or hybridized things you know pretty much everything in our society is modified and hybridized um, because if not we wouldn't even be able to eat it, it would be inedible is it okay to eat fruit after a meal or should I eat fruit two to three hours before or after meals? Um, it's good to just eat fruit with a meal or right after a meal because you never want to eat protein alone. If you're kind of sticking to that protein carbon fat rule, you don't want to be um, eating protein alone because remember protein drops your blood sugar quite low. It, it stimulates a huge insulin response which opens up your cells and allows sugar into the cells quite quickly, which drops you into a hypoglycemic state. And then what has to happen? Your body has to make glucose. How does it do that? Cortisol raises. And so we don't want ourselves dropping into hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, which is one of the reasons why I talk so strongly against a ketogenic diet. People need to understand that ketosis in itself requires you going into a hypoglycemic state, raising adrenal adrenaline and cortisol so that your body actually has to start manufacturing glucose a lot of people are not um, burning uh, fat very well they're not in ketosis very well and 
if you are in ketosis, it does require a lot of stress. So it is a stress state in itself. Um, but I don't think that you should eat protein alone. So if you're eating it after a meal, maybe consider eating it with a meal. I have a lot of water retention in my whole body and feet and face. Any tips on how to reduce it? Stop over hyperhydrating. It's called hyperhydration. A lot of people are just chugging water all day when they're not thirsty, which causes your cells to have to swell with water to retain minerals. So a lot of people don't recognize that hydration has nothing to, well, it has something to do with water, but it doesn't just have everything to do with water. It has to do with minerals as well. Minerals are what determine how water gets into the cell and is used by the cell. And if you're just chugging water all day you're flushing out minerals b vitamins um and you're you're forcing your body to have to retain those minerals and how it does that is swell with water and it's just so like a lot of women are just so over hydrating themselves and they're heavy and bloated and edemic they're just like they're you know they're just retaining so much water their cells are swollen with water not recognizing that their chugging habit is literally what's keeping them heavy and bloated your body has a signal that tells you to drink when you are thirsty and you should not be drinking anymore because you don't need to sit there and, and see how much water is coming from my food, how much water is coming from this, how much water is coming from this. Your body does that for you. And then it gives you a signal saying like, hey, we need a little bit more water. And then you drink when you're thirsty, right? You never see like an animal going like at 5 p.m. like, got to make it to my water hole for my daily gallon. Like, let's go. Chug, 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 chug. Like, have you ever seen an animal do that? Watch your dogs. Watch your cats. They go and drink when they're thirsty. Why are we so stupid that we don't, you know, we neglect our body signals and we think we have to override our body. So for edemic problems or water retention, the first thing is always just don't over drink water. Just hydrate when your body asks to be hydrated and always focus on mineral rich hydration. You know, fruits, um, uh, fruit juices and broths and milk. Milk's an awesome way to get hydration and get protein, carbs, and fat, and also get tons of fat-soluble vitamins, which are awesome for your skin, your hair, your nails, and wonderful for your metabolic function. So if you can tolerate milk, I used to hate milk, but now I see it as such a health food that I literally like drink milk all day, and my body actually has begun to crave it. I was one of those kids that never drank milk, hated milk, thought it was disgusting, and now I literally drink it all the time because I love it. First of all, it makes my muscles look so strong and toned and not like no other protein on the planet and it also just makes me feel really really good um and if you still struggle with water retention after really working on your hydration practices then it might be progesterone remember that progesterone also acts as a diuretic it helps us flush water it keeps our cells really healthy and so if you have a lot of estrogen dominance especially in that last half of the cycle if the bloating and water retention really ramps itself up that second half of the cycle then it might be a progesterone related issue honestly you guys hear me always say progesterone sorry it's getting a little cold i gotta uh, turn off my my office fan um so uh, you'll hear me talk about progesterone a lot, but honest to God truth, almost every single woman has a progesterone or an ovulation issue, literally. Like, I rarely find someone who has, <laughs> who has like, oh, it's an estrogen issue or it's a testosterone issue. It's almost always an ovulation issue or a progesterone issue. Um, vertical ridges, lines on nails, is it just a sign of aging? No, it's usually a sign of like either protein deficiency or it can be B vitamins or other minerals like zinc or copper or things like that. Definitely could be a sign of some issues. It's just like kind of one of those things where if, you know, the hair is really dry and cracked or brittle, it, it, it usually is telling you there's a problem and it's very similar with nails. When baking, what do you use as an alternative to wheat flour? I see so many recipes stuffing almond flour, but I'm aware of your stance on nuts and seeds. Yeah, and obviously, you guys, it's like eating a handful of walnuts or macadamia nuts is different than eating a cupcake that literally has like, you know, 50 walnuts ground down or almonds ground down to to be flour. It's very easy to overconsume nuts and seeds. And a lot of these paleo recipes, a lot of these paleo people they don't really understand the the even the paleo stance on nuts and seeds was that you should consume 
very small amounts maybe once or twice a week that was like the guy that invented the paleo diet even said that like it was very much acknowledged that seeds are and nuts are estrogenic and also very high in the same um uh, lectins and phytates that grains and beans are and so it was like kind of one of those things where like be careful with nuts and then like paleo people just took it as like oh you know we're not eating wheat we're eating seeds and nuts and they're like literally pounding almond flour all day long it's so easy to overconsume nuts when you're using almond flour but all that to say is that um, I like ancient grains so you know you can always do like einkorn flour or spelt flour um, or you can just do like I like Pamela's baking mix it's like a, a rice based um, like a, it's called like sweet rice flour um, and you can do like a lot of that like a lot of people will use sweet rice flour and it, it works fine um, usually anything that has white rice in it is usually fine like white rice is just starch it's pure starch so it doesn't have any bran it doesn't have any irritating properties to it so um, I like Pamela's baking mix for that or um, Bob's Red Mill's one-to-one -one baking flour is also pretty clean so I just look for something that I tolerate fine that even though it's grain based it's actually like less inflammatory than like a nut based flour um, and it's less calorie dense honestly like my biggest thing is people that are pounding like paleo baked goods I'm like oh, that was like a fat gaining food for show you know you're just like pounding the calories you know some of these paleo like cupcakes are gonna be like 700 calories from all the almond flour they're using so um, it's just kind of one of those things where I prefer using like a um, refined grain flour that's just like gluten-free over something that is gonna be like really calorie dense and really like also pretty irritating to my gut. I get a lot of acid reflux in the morning even with lemon water. What am I doing wrong? Oh, it's hard to know. Like when I get questions like that, it's always like, you know, I have to look at a whole health history like what's going on with the gallbladder what's going on with you know the stomach there could be h pylori present like a lot of times i start digging into someone's health history and there's even more issues um so yeah i know that i owe you an email and like i said i will be answering my emails after i go live today so um yeah we got to kind of figure out what's going on in your gut for sure can a herniated diaphragm be reversed um, herniated, yeah, so usually there's there's some issues going on for sure, intestinal inflammation, um, there can be like, it, it's definitely something that has to be dug into for sure. There's always a reason why it happens though, that is that is a definite. And it, it's also one of those things where sometimes women don't realize when they have kids that, um, DR is a real thing. So women go into pregnancy with very weak cores, not realizing that it's very easy for your abs to separate into diastasis recti real quick. And then, you know, so you have this abs separation after a baby and then all this societal pressure of, oh, gotta get back, like gotta get those abs back, gotta get your body back. And so you start working out, you start, you know, doing running or even like intense exercise or crunches or things like that. And you have this ab gap right in the middle of your abs and it never heals properly because doctors don't always look for it and women don't know about it and so you end up having you know it, it, I mean it's a separation in the muscles so things can get really weak things can start to poke out the diaphragm can be um, um, affected so can the pelvic floor so that's really something like it's, it's hard to know you have to kind of dig into your history and see what can maybe be driving a herniated diaphragm Ever since I got diagnosed with hypothyroid and Graves, I noticed I'm getting a lot of gray hair. Do you recommend anything? Gray hair can be because of a copper deficiency or it's really like copper toxicity, but you have a lot of non-available copper in the body. So really you're not, you're deficient in copper. Even though there's a lot of copper in the body, you're not actually able to utilize it. But usually copper um, is what's going to cause graying hair. My eyesight is getting worse. Can this be reversed? Um, sometimes. It definitely can be very hormonal related. Remember, your eyes actually have a purpose besides seeing. Um, your, your eyes can actually synthesize lots of hormones. So when pregnenolone is low or progesterone is low, sometimes um, your eyesight can definitely decline or decrease over time. Um, or if you're having severe like blood sugar issues, that can really affect 
the tissue of the eyes. So yes, there are some things that you can do for sure. Um, it's just like one of those things where kind of digging into what the root of your issues are and that's where you're going to kind of find what might be driving the eyesight decline. After I followed your health tips, I think I got cervical mucus today. Yay, not sure though. Normal to get on day 12. Is it normal that the vagina odor changes when I do changes? Yes, so um, day 12, I mean, that's a little bit of an early ovulation, but who cares, right? An ovulation is an ovulation and that's awesome to be celebrated. Because remember, the first goal is to get yourself ovulating well, and then you can kind of start to really try to push that follicular phase a little longer, get that luteal phase a little longer as your health improves. But if if you're not ovulating the goal is to ovulate first any ovulation is good ovulation and then kind of work on continue to continuing to improve the cycle over time when it comes to vaginal odor a lot of women don't recognize that your vagina is a self-cleaning machine and it's so important to first of all never wash with soap down there it makes it worse um your your body has to compensate now you wash away bacteria bacteria comes back with a vengeance and it is an endocrine disruptor in itself to wash your vagina and your body with soap doesn't matter how natural the soap is washing bacteria off your body is literally like washing part of your immune system away and until that immune system is back to full capacity, which sometimes can take up to a week, your body is very stressed out. You're susceptible to, you know, viruses and things landing on your skin and your body knows that that's a stressful thing. And so, um... Uh, that's all that's a long story to say like don't wash your vagina with soap if that's happening or you know that area with soap I hate saying the vagina because it's not technically that but um you know all your lady parts and then watch your odor change you will as you get healthier you'll find that you do have like every woman has a natural odor there's there's nothing to be ashamed about it's just normal um but as you get healthier if you do have like more of a fishy odor or very like pungent and kind of like you know, a little like, whether it's like a little fermenty smelling, like a little yeasty smelling, um, or a little like more bacterial side, like just a little smelly, um, you'll see as your health improves, so does your vaginal odor. Every woman should have like their own scent. That's normal. It's pheromones, you know, welcome to biology 101. But it shouldn't be like overly like stinky. If that's the case, or there's certain parts of your cycle where it is stinky, like it's like, oof, oof, oof then that can be a sign that there might be a little bit of imbalance occurring. But as you get healthier over time, you can definitely see that improve. You briefly just mentioned sleeping poorly during period. Would this just be due to stress or are there other reasons? I find I sleep only about three hours at a time and have to get up to pee. Um, yeah, that could be stress, like if you're not eating enough during your period, or it could be, you know, you're not making enough progesterone during the luteal phase, and so that's kind of carrying into your cycle. Um, there's a lot of estrogen at play and that could really disrupt sleep for sure. And estrogen, remember you guys, in high amounts is a stress hormone in itself. So we definitely don't want that. So we really want to focus on detoxification during the luteal phase, really focus on getting those progesterone levels up and that usually improves sleep during the period. Sometimes like for me, I still take bioidentical progesterone. I still take care of myself during my period, but I sometimes find that I'll have like one or two days where I do have a little bit more disrupted sleep. And, um, that is, it, it's not normal, but it's, it, it can be. And so it's like, you really want to work on that and watch that improve over time. But a little bit of sleep disruption can be normal, but that's definitely something that you want to look into like estrogen wise, progesterone wise, really focusing on detoxification and then keeping your meals really balanced and really frequent during your period, you are, your blood sugar is very imbalanced. And so you can actually really get um, like very, uh, lots of stress going on really quickly if you're not um, working hard to keep your blood sugar balanced. Do you still struggle with small intestinal bacteria overgrowth? Um, no, I always had a very sensitive gut and that's why like for me, it was really interesting because I saw a lot of women on paleo and AIP coming to me and they were still having gut issues and like I was included in that and I was just like, hmm, maybe this is really bad for your gut, which is why I actually started like looking into things. And um, 
Uh, I like always say like I'm definitely the canary in the coal mine when it comes to gut issues. If it bothers me, it's going to bother it like it's kind of one of those things where um even if it doesn't bother everyone else, if it bothers me, like I know it's probably irritating to the gut on some level just cuz I have such a sensitive gut, but I no longer struggle with SIBO. I had to literally go vegetable free for like a year <laughs> and that really got rid of like the intense pregnancy bloating that I literally looked like I was 7 months pregnant. Literally I could push my belly out and I was like a pregnant belly for sure. I got my gallbladder removed 12 years ago and I used anti-reflux medication Nexium for 10 years but stopped three years ago. What should I do? Thoughts on making soul. Yeah, soul can be helpful. Um, it's really about restoring those stomach acid levels. A lot of people with long-term anti-acid use actually have, or proton pump inhibitors, actually have H. pylori because when you lower the stomach acid, you usually just kind of are inviting pathogens into your whole digestive tract, like saying, you have arrived, enjoy your ride, like pass on through. And so um, your stomach acid is kind of that first line of defense. And so when stomach acid is a low, a lot of people struggle from GERD and heart, uh, reflux because of H. pylori, which is a bacteria that can live in the stomach. And it's kind of like a corkscrew. It will like corkscrew itself into the um, stomach and then it will neutralize your stomach acid. And so like the biggest thing is that you get heartburn. It's not because of of um, high stomach acid is actually low stomach acid, but they give you proton pump inhibitors to continue to lower stomach acid, which allows the H. pylori to just proliferate even more. So after 10 years of, of Nexium use, I always almost always recommend getting a, a GI map because you probably have lots of pathogens, a fun little microbiome of just an ecosystem that has grown and sometimes H. pylori as well. Based on your last post, what are some good sources of good carbs and protein? Protein comes from grass-fed organs, um, grass-fed like beef, lamb, um, you know, organic chicken, um, lots of like gelatinous foods, so gelatin, collagen, um, bone broth, dairy, and eggs. Those are awesome sources of protein. That's where, you know, bioavailable protein is where it's at. Carbs kind of stick to the mantra of fruits and roots, fruits and roots. A little bit of honey, a little bit of coconut sugar, all that fun stuff is fine. But um, I usually say like grain-based carbs should be more of a treat than a staple. And um, roots and fruits are really where it's at because they're easy to digest and they're really, really good for the endocrine system. Really great for, they provide lots of vitamins and minerals on top of actually nourishing your body. Um, any suggestions for a goiter? Yeah, a lot of people don't know what to do for a goiter and some natural desiccated thyroid medication usually takes care of a goiter really quickly, like something like Nature Throid or Armour Thyroid. I cannot get my hands on organic oranges. Is that bad? What to do if low in vitamin D but never had sun where I live? How to know if I get the right coconut water? Oranges, it's kind of one of those things where just like get the, your hands on the best you can. Um, wash them really well on the outside and then um, if they're if you're low in vitamin d but never have sun where you live consider like incandescent lights that can be helpful or even getting like a reptile light um that can help you make vitamin d um and you can always supplement with it i just like a liquid supplement like carlson's brand and then coconut water it's kind of one of those things where you just want to turn it around make sure it's just pure coconut water and not like water sugar and coconut concentrate I never feel hungry anymore and I keep gaining weight. I eat because I know I have to, but it's hard to do when I'm just getting fatter. Any idea what's going on? I was hungry every two to three hours before. Yeah, so what happens is the stress system starts to turn on. When we don't eat, our body still needs fuel, right? We don't like, it's not like our body runs on thin air. Our body will make its own fuel. And this is what happens. You are forcing, without eating, our body starts to just switch into the adrenaline and cortisol response automatically. The body's like, I'm not even gonna ask anymore because you don't ever, don't ever give it to me. And so what happens is your body's actually creating its own fuel using muscle and collagen and tissues and raising blood glucose and then because of the stress there's insulin resistance involved usually or thyroid issues it could absolutely be thyroid issues too a lot of times when we go without really eating and we turn on the stress response it completely suppresses thyroid metabolism our, our metabolism is no longer functioning our body's completely um, cutting all corners possible to conserve as much energy and store as much energy as fuel 
So it's more about getting your body out of a, a stressed out state and getting it into a safety state so it don't no longer relies upon making its own fuel using cortisol and adrenaline. Whenever we see fat gain, it's usually a thyroid issue, a stress issue, or an insulin resistance issue which is driven by gut and liver issues or estrogen dominance, either one um, or all three. <laughs> so um, it's one of those things where we, ha we have to recognize that regardless of if we're gaining weight or not, we need to honor our bodies, you guys. It is not worth it to punish or restrict your bodies if you're gaining weight. There's another reason, it's not the food. And we have to acknowledge that because starving ourselves just makes it worse. We'll gain more and more. I've been having a headache and migraines for 18 days now. My cycle has been regular for a while, but I'm on day 60 of my cycle now, getting so tired of the pain. So migraines are almost always caused by estrogen dominance. A raw carrot salad with some coconut oil and some white vinegar can be very helpful at detoxing estrogen done every single day. Um, vitamin E can also be really, really helpful for estrogen. We talk more about what we can learn in Fully Nourished or make a highlight story about it. Yes, so next week it's going to be kind of all about Fully Nourished for a week. Bear with me, you guys. It's going to be kind of like launch week and I'll be offering a lot more information on what you'll get in Fully Nourished, um, what you'll um you, you know what it's going to be all about you'll get all your questions answered lower sugar or lower salt for high blood sh pressure neither usually high blood pressure is actually caused by a sodium and potassium deficiency white or brown rice jessica you have saved my life i cannot get enough of you <laughs> oh you're so sweet lynn um white rice just because brown rice has the bran and it usually tends to irritate the digestive tract a little more whereas white rice is just pure starch I've been overweight my whole life, but I only started getting cellulite when I turned 35. Is cellulite a hormonal thing? Yeah, it's usually driven by um, estrogen um, and insulin resistance for sure, um, but it can be driven by thyroid issues for as well. So a lot of people that are overweight their whole life actually have um, thyroid issues usually their whole life, and thyroid can affect how you detox by estrogen. So yeah, it's a hormonal thing for sure. And Lizzie asked what kind of milk Instagram's cutting me off. It's been an hour, so I'm going to go live one more time, and I'll finish answering all your guys' questions. See you in a sec.